Opens like at eight, I'm there at 7.30, just looking to make sure nobody snuck in there and <laughs> I'm waiting for the dealer to open for the dealer. And you know, finally it, it opens. And then I casually walk around the corner and there he is in his booth. I was just kind of walking by and goes, all right, you can have it for 1400. I had that money out of my hand and in his pocket within about eight seconds. So you meet Bob Gallegos. I met Bob Gallegos at this friend of mine, Rich Schneider's house. He'd come up with a bunch of other guys for poker night. Uh -huh. And so I, I learned, I met Bob Gallegos and learned how smart he really was at the poker uh -huh. table. <laughs> and how old was Bob at that time? He was a young kid. I was 20, yeah, I want to say 24, 25, yeah. something like that. And he's a couple of years younger than I was. Yeah. And he and Cindy were newly married. Oh, yeah. No kids yet. And uh, Was he still working as a bank teller at that time? Yes. Yeah. And uh, so I, and so we became friends. And, and I used to fly back from L.A. to Albuquerque sometimes every other month, both to play poker and look for Indian stuff. And so you'd fly in with a bunch of money or as much money as you could have. Did you have to pay cash in those days? Was it that kind of thing? Pretty much. Yeah, I would think like, who's this kid's going to write me a check? I don't think so. Yeah. And guys that you'd never met. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, maybe after you'd done Got repeat business, you know, they'd take your check. But in the beginning, no. And what year would have this been approximately? Oh, God, I'm trying to think here. 24, right? Yeah, I'm thinking 70. Two yeah. seventy three somewhere well, that's in the there. squash blossom stuff is just going crazy at that point. It was starting. Yeah, it, it's starting. Um, and it, so Bob invited me over to his house because he wanted to show me what he was interested in, and he had a he showed me a glass vitrine that was, you know, about two feet wide and yeah. six feet tall, and he had about fifteen or twenty pots in yeah. there and that was his deal and then and that's pretty good considering he's just a young kid yeah oh he had the interest you know clearly and, and uh i think within two or three years of that he quit the bank and became full-time dealer right and i mean he was you know trap take picking up contemporary pottery from the different pueblos and driving in all over the country i mean he used to come through santa barbara and the or about 76, 77, mm -hmm. 78, with a truckload of, of pottery, and he'd be hitting the trading post and Indian shops in L.A., San right. Diego, coming up the <laughs> coast, go up to Big Sur, going to San Francisco. I mean, he, he was a hard-working yeah, boy. Yeah, still is, actually. Yeah, he was. And um, on one of those occasions when... I came over there for a poker game and, you know, to look for stuff. Uh, he and Rich were doing an antique show in Albuquerque and they invited, asked me if I wanted to come and, mm -hmm. you know, help them load in and hang out. And so I did. And right across from their booth was a row of about two or three eight foot tables. And everybody else is setting up and whoever is going to be there hasn't arrived yet. And I'd say within an hour before they went to shut down that load in. This, I just remember this Indian from Oklahoma comes in, and he was a big boy. I mean, mm -hmm. I he, six eight or something right. at yeah. least, and he's slipping these bags and he throws them on the table and he starts pulling out all these textiles, and um, you know we're getting ready to leave. And I'm, we're there for another 40 minutes or whatever, and then we do leave. And then we come back the next morning, and I'm over there looking at, at all his textiles, and I see this thing that I, it was extraordinarily beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I go, what is this thing? I'd never seen anything like it. <laughs> and I look at the label, and it says, 18th century chief's blanket <laughs> bietta yeah. made from 
Spanish soldiers' uniforms. And I'm going, this is horseshit. <laughs> and so he comes in a little later, and I go over to him, being a young, arrogant punk that I was. I said, this is crap. This is an 18th century, it's not a chief's blanket, and it's not Bayetta. And he goes, get out of my booth. <laughs> and then I go, okay. <laughs> so, but I can't take my eyes off this thing. And every couple hours I'd go check and make sure it was still there. Because I did, I, I, it was fascinating to me. Did you know what it was? No. Yeah. I had no idea. Yeah. You just knew it was a great weaving. Yeah. And early, but you and didn't early know. And early and, I mean, you know, great saltillo is just a great thing. Right. And... Um, so the show goes on in its final day and about two or three, two hours left, maybe afternoon of Sunday, you know, three, three o'clock, whatever. And I see this little gray haired lady over talking to him and maybe I'm not paying much attention. And then like 20 minutes later, I see her going out the door and she's got this thing rolled up under <laughs> her arm. Yeah. And so I go over, did you rip off that old lady? And, yeah. and he goes, you're right, it wasn't a cheese blanket, and you're right, it wasn't Bayetta, but it was 18th century, and that's a Saltillo Serapi uh -huh. from Mexico. And I go, God damn, what a... I knew in my mind if I ever saw one again, I wasn't going to let it get away right. from me. Uh -huh. So now I knew at least what a Saltillo could look like. Right, and feel like. Yeah, and uh, so that's what kind of started the whole Saltillo thing. Well, that, it absolutely is what started it. And, um, you know, I saw a couple over the next year or two, but they were so beat up and they weren't that, you know, right. they weren't like that one. They were a little thicker and heavier, mm -hmm. moth eaten and missing ends. And yeah. So I, what I knew that wasn't, was what I was looking for. And then in 75, I went to Bob Ashton's Denver show and um, I'm walking in the morning and Bob Ward had a booth just to the right of the main you know, main aisle. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Bob and I would have been friends. And so I walk over to see what he's got. And I see this saltillo hanging that was even better than the one I, the, <laughs> that I first saw. And I'm going, oh my God. So, you know, casually go over and I'm looking at it and I pull up the price tag and it's $1,500. This is 75, 1975? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. January of 1975, mm -hmm. February of 1975. And I go, Bob, what's my price? And he said, 1500 <laughs> And I go, come on, man. He goes, no, that's a deal at 1500 and so I just kind of, it kind of pissed me off a little bit. So I walked away. And uh, that night in the hotel room, I'm laying there and I'm going, you idiot, what is wrong with you? <laughs> I, I was going to buy the next one I saw <laughs> and there it is. So I'm going, I'm, I'm so worried that somebody else bought it. I can't sleep. Show <laughs> opens I, at 8, I'm there at 7.30 just looking to make sure nobody snuck in there and, <laughs> and waiting for the dealer to open for the dealers. And, you know, finally it, it opens. And then I casually walk around the corner and there he is in his booth. And, and you know, I'm just kind of walking by and he goes, all right, you can have it for 1400 <laughs> I had that money out of my hand and in his pocket <laughs> within about eight <laughs> seconds. And was this Ashton that had it or was it Bob Ward? Bob Ward. It was Bob Ward. But Ashton show. Yeah, okay. Right, Sharon, <laughs> he and Sharon Good at the time. And um, so that was the beginning for me of the Saltillo thing. And, um, and so what did you do? So you get this great blanket. You really don't know much about them. I, no, Probably I don't. don't know the price structure either because they're not out There is here. no price yeah, structure. Yeah, right. You just know the great, wonderful blanket. So how do you go about researching and trying to either make a market or just get more of them? Well, at this point, I don't want to make a market because yeah. I only have one. I want to get a, 
number of them before yeah. I start trying to create a market. Uh -huh. um, but I start asking, you know, I'd go see Oriental rug dealers and I'd just see other Indian dealers and go, look, I'm looking for this and I have something to show them mm -hmm. or at least a picture that this is the kind of thing I'm looking for. And so I start finding a couple, you know, maybe one or two a year in the first year and then more people know what I'm looking for and so I'm accumulating a few more and the price is going up and um, so I start going back east and specifically because you thought, well, maybe there's maybe, not back. Yeah. Any back there. Well, and I, I would go back. I was going back for small auctions, you know, in upstate New York and right. Connecticut that would have Indian stuff and paintings and, you know, right. still looking for stuff to buy for the market, you know, to sell. But I thought, you know, so much early trade from California to the New England with the uh, hide ships and all that right. kind of stuff. And, you know, most of the soldiers that had been in the Mexican War came from the East or the Midwest. They weren't coming from California because mm -hmm. California was still Mexico. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, and I mean, I'd go into top Oriental rug dealers in New York or in Boston or Rhode Island, wherever. And I started finding more than and good ones. Yeah, you started actually finding them. Yeah, and yeah, they became a little more commonplace. <clears throat> and um, I remember I bought a really good one from one of the dealers in Manhattan. And then um, I had a friend told me that he knew a guy that thought he had one. And he was in um, Rhode Island, Providence. And he was kind of an Orion rug collector. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I met him and went, went over and he had a really great one. Didn't want to sell it to me right away, but you know, within six months he called me and said, "Okay, you, know, mm -hmm. you can have it." And other people started calling me. The word started to get out. Yeah, and then I was always telling, spreading the word. You know, I'm looking for these. Yeah. At some point, you know, you now's the time. Yeah. Put the gas on. And then I find out that. A guy would buy one from a dealer, pay a certain price, then call me and raise the price. So now right. the prices just keep getting right. higher, and higher, higher and higher. And then all of a sudden, guys that had sold me one mm -hmm. get another one and they're going, oh, wait a minute, why is he buying these things? Mm -hmm. And they start really looking at them <laughs> and they start falling in love. Is that when Mark Winter started falling in love with it? Not no, yet. Mm -mm, no. And, uh, but oh, there's a guy, Peter Brock, that was yeah. a textile collector. Right. Um, even Oriental rug dealers were going, wait a minute, these are, these yeah. are as good as any Kaleem I've ever seen, you know. But, you know, in the beginning, if it wasn't their thing, they right. didn't care. Yeah. But th that started to change. And, um, but one of the interesting stories was when the the day I bought that great one from Bob Ward, I went over and, you know, I was traveling with Stan Pepper and there was a whole group of Navajo t textile dealers. And, mm -hmm. and we had just sold a group of textiles in Aspen for like, I had a briefcase with $70,000 in it. Yeah, that was huge. And, um, you know, I just paid 1400 for this great thing. So I pulled this thing out and threw it on the floor and I telling all these guys, look at this. Right. And they're all standing around looking at it. And they go, it's Mexican. <laughs> and they turn around and walk away like <laughs> I, like they were insulted or something. Uh -huh. That's funny. And, and it was funny. And um, But I, I guarantee you within four or five years from that point, they were all looking for them. Yeah, I'm sure. And... Um, and the price structure keeps going up. Oh, yeah. And uh, so in 78, 
uh, the Santa Barbara Museum of Art decides they, they'll have a, an exhibit of, mm -hmm. of the Saltier. Did you go and talk to them about maybe doing this? Oh, yeah. yeah, That's yeah. What I, I, I presented. I, I knew the director. Mm -hmm. um, he was a friend of mine. And then he had a, and he was an older guy. Um, he thought it was a great idea. Yeah. But he had a young uh, um, assistant director who was really energetic and goes, yeah, this is good, yeah. you know. Yeah, it fits it perfectly, too. Yeah. And um, so they went to the board, and the board thought it was a great idea. And then it kind of became, instead of a, just a Santa Barbara thing, they spread you know, offered subscriptions to the exhibit. Um, and within six months, they had 23 subscribers. And it now became a three-year traveling exhibition. Mm. And they wanted a catalog. So I had about three months to produce a catalog. Mm -hmm. And there was a young lady that was working for the art museum. She was working on her master's at UCSB. Uh, didn't know anything about textiles at all, mm -hmm. let alone saltitas, but she was a really good writer and a good researcher. And so I had been collecting information and for the previous three years, my mom, who had was had was uh, uh, an alumni of, of uh, University of California, mm -hmm. um, went. She was up doing some summer teacher thing, and she went into the Bancroft and started researching. Had access to all the master's theses and doctorate theses mm -hmm. and stuff, and going through, and she found this very interesting master's thesis on saltillos right. by a woman named Catherine Jenkins. And that was done in like the 50s? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I'd had that now for a couple of years. And and it's I started, I mean, she did some really good analysis. Right. She didn't know much about the history of it, but she just started analyzing sizes and weaves and mm -hmm. and design elements yeah and trying to find a classification because there wasn't anything you're right and she was very good at it and um and then she found and um there was a publication in mexico in 1935 by a guy named last name mena who had done a pamphlet on the saltillo serapi mm. and that was some pretty good information not a lot, but it was what was there was good. And early. Yeah, and and early, and so then I was, I, w I went down to Mexico a number of times, trying to look for saltillos. Harder to find them there than in the United States. Yeah, I believe that. But I did meet a woman that um, had a pretty famous restaurant in uh, Zona Rosa, and her. She was, this would have been, you know, 73, you know, after seven, 76, 77, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. And um, I told her what I was looking for. And she goes, oh, come to my house. Hmm. And, and I, this is in Mexico? This is Mexico City. Yeah. And um, so I did. And she had four or five. And they were all in very good condition and they had all been collected by her father mm. and he had been an engineer building railroads and all that kind of stuff northern mexico probably yeah i'm sure yeah and her name was judith van buren and her father had been a prominent american engineer and mm -hmm. but they she grew up in mexico with the family because he'd taken this job and was down mm -hmm. there and then so she just stayed. She stayed and he retired mm -hmm. there and, and they were, became Mexican citizens. And so I'm going, wow, this is, this is good. This is, yeah. <laughs> and so I said, man, these are really nice. I said, would you consider selling them? And she said, sure. And I said, great. Can you give me some prices? And she said, yeah, I want $50,000 a piece. <laughs> 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 and I'm going, wow. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that's going to work, but yeah. you know, I thanked her. And she let me have pictures, and right, you know, at least it was further research. Yeah, and were you able to use any of the images in the catalog that you guys did? No. Yeah. 
Um, but I used them for my own reference because one of the things that, that you know, the more you see, the more you can begin to piece together right. the picture. And then one of the saltillos I had at home was a, was a round center mm -hmm. and the two blues and that kind of yellow ochre, golden color and white. Mm -hmm. And it was, a, it had that scalloped round mm -hmm. center. You've had a few of those. Yeah. And she had one that was all in reds. Hmm. And I kind of really wanted to get it because it was almost a, a dead ringer of mine, except the color scheme was totally different. Mm. And, uh, you know, similar background and border, and probably from the same workshop. So that was good, though. I mean, I'm really starting to feel like I'm starting to learn something and starting to get a handle on it. And, and uh, so I'm really pursuing it. And now I'm kind of the beginning to develop a business plan where I can see there is a future here. And it's not just me trying to find them. I'm now trying to figure out a way to promote them. And of course the art show was the museum show was that. And, um, and how many pieces did you have in that museum show? Do you remember? I don't, I didn't have all of mine cause I borrowed some others from other people. I borrowed two from the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. Mm -hmm. I borrowed some from a couple of private people. But most of those were yours at most that time? Most of them were mine. And, and, you know, I also had borrowed, uh, let's see, I also had a Rio Grande in there that was mine. But I borrowed Rio Grande from somebody else. I borrowed Navajo blanket from somebody else mm -hmm. that related to the influence sure. of the Saltillo on weaving in the Southwest. And, um, because there must have been what 25 Satios, yeah, yeah, that's what I was saying. I, yeah, I, I used that book extensively for many years. Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> I yeah. own some of those pieces ultimately, yeah, out of there. Um, and I, I think of the, I think I probably had 18, 16 yeah. to 18 that were mine, yeah, and uh, then I had some later, later ones that I borrowed that had pictorial stuff that you know, 1900, 1920s, 1890s. Mm -hmm. Um, did you have any clue how rare they were at this time? Because that's one of the problems if you're going to make a market and deal with them, if you can only get one a year. Well, yes, I did. Almost impossible yes, to make that market. Yes, I did begin to get an idea. Um, I, I went to the uh, Santa Fe Museum of Folk Art, mm -hmm. and one of the curators at that time was um, Bunny E. Boyd, uh, Bunny Boyd. And her sister, older sister, had been E. Boyd. Yeah, who wrote all the Hispanic mm -hmm. textile book. And, all that. and that the one I saw that walked out of that Albuquerque show with this little old lady uh -huh. it was E. Boyd that bought it. Oh, that's hilarious. And so I, you know, huh? <laughs> that's huh? why I go, whoa. Huh? <laughs> My eyes are open. So, yeah. But E. Boyd had died, and uh, but her sister was still working there. And really nice lady and very gracious and and she goes you know before she died he had had me compiling researching with all the different museums mm -hmm. how many saltillos they had in their collections mm -hmm. and so i started finding out like you know the museum of american history had maybe eight mm -hmm. And then you've been donated by this person or that person. And most of the donations had been from families of relatives that had been in the Mexican American Mexican war, you know, mm -hmm. brought them back in 1846, 48. And, um, then there was a big collection in, I think the St. Louis Historical Society or one of the big museums in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And they had maybe 18 or 20. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah. And they had been donated as a collection from a guy named Anson Hard, who had been a Civil War guy, but I mean a Mexican War guy, but also before that had been in the Santa Fe Trail mm -hmm. trade. So he had, you know, picking them up yeah. in New Mexico. And even they, some of these guys went down to Chihuahua 
and right. um, would, were picking up. Yeah, and they probably were fairly affordable compared to Navajo yeah. blankets, for yeah. even though they're finer than Navajo blankets. Yeah, but the, yeah, the thing, the Navajo, great Navajo textiles at that time, though, had developed this reputation of being waterproof. And I mean, right. finest. Yeah, among the, the even America. among the mountain men and the traders, the Navajo Serapi was right. considered the. Yeah, that was it ultimate you know and if you had one of those you were you were good yeah um but anyway that's kind of how that whole thing evolved and so you do the show in santa barbara mm -hmm. it runs to three different museums 18 museums 18 museums. yeah it goes in goes it it actually didn't open in santa barbara it opened at um Big museum in Washington, D.C. Um, it's mm, it's no, it's it's uh, you know it's not the textile museum. Yeah, so it opens in D.C. in, in and D.C. It goes to eighteen mm -hmm. museums. How did you did they set it up? The Santa Barbara people set up. Yeah, that? they That's sold cool. subscriptions. You know, and they put the word out among all the different museums. I see. And if if they liked it and they wanted it, yes, then they would subscribe to it. And pay yep. pay them a fee. fee yeah. yeah, and that went for three years. Three years. Yeah, and so your textiles, along with the other ones, are on. Display. Yeah. So when it ends in three years, mm -hmm. eighteen museums and catalog, the word in the Indian world, I'm sure in the in that field, is like, oh, these are amazing. Well, and and just among people that didn't even know they existed, yeah, sure. you know, when you see them in a museum, and I mean, it went to the Tucson Museum of Art, mm -hmm. went to the Bird Museum. And what years was this? 75, uh, no, 78 to 81. Yeah. Because I wrote the, the catalog in 78. Mm. And that got it published within like two weeks after the show <laughs> opened. But, right, you know, to see. Yeah. But then I was shipping them catalogs. And every museum in their subscription got, you know, I don't know, 50, 60 books, catalogs. And did that bring out more weavings, more satias, and they came, I would assume, it did. to you? It, it did. Yeah. Um, you know, and it was kind of a mixed blessing because there are now people that were seeing these things and going, wow, these are beautiful. So I began to get more and more competition. Yeah, I'm sure. It's just natural. Um, and, you know, I'd find out that I was competing against myself in some cases. Yeah. Um, but the whole market was moving in the right direction, mm -hmm. and that's really what I wanted to see. Mm -hmm. And um, then before the last show, it closed in, in Santa Barbara. And um, Mark Winter started inquiring about it, mm -hmm. you know, and we knew each other from the Indian thing, you know, mm -hmm. and he was always a textile guy. Right. And um, so he was getting interested, and then he kept saying, well, give me a price and this <laughs> and that. And I'm, you know, I'm not quite thinking I'm going to sell yet. I think there's still time for me to collect more. And, um, but finally we get to a point where I, you know, okay. Yeah, he hounds you enough, and the price gets up to a point where yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, made work, and so he bought the whole collection. Yeah, and then as uh, as a result of that, anytime I got another good saltillo, I had committed myself that if I find more, I'll sell them to you at the same price you're paying right. for the other ones. And so I think I, you know, after he bought the collection, I think I think that I probably sold him twenty eight thirty. Mm. And other people I knew that had them, I would, if, if I couldn't buy it, I'd let Mark go deal with them. Mm -hmm. And so he, you know, he's the ultimate Saltillo guy now. I mean, yeah, one of them. Yeah, he's got the most. And yeah. He has great knowledge, but and, uh, there's a few of them out there. That... Yes, there are. <laughs> yes, there are. That must be pretty rewarding, actually, to think that you took this market that no one knew about and educated people, did real, uh, research and then did a 18 show museum show that's that's gonna be rewarding i would think um oh i thought it was fabulous at the time but once i'm done with it mm -hmm. i was done 
I mean, I, I, I did it. Else? You know, I yeah. did everything. I mean, I brought them, showed them to the world. The world loved them. I did the book. They bought them, took, made money. Right. What's next? And so what was next? Jewelry? No, I'd been in the jewelry thing for yeah. a long time. So what was next? Um... Well, I met Carlos Osona mm -hmm. in, at the time I was collecting these when I first moved to Santa Barbara. And um, we became pretty good friends. And he was living half the year in Argentina and half the year in Scottsdale. He had a father and stepmother who lived in mm -hmm. Scottsdale. And uh, do you ever know Carlos? Mm -hmm. yeah, he was a rascal, but... Geez, he was smart. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was a gifted artist, gifted art historian. Mm -hmm. um, and just one of those unique people, mm -hmm. you know. So you're right. And uh, anyway, I invited him to come to Santa Barbara, and, and uh, he decided he would. So he. I was over in Scottsdale visiting him, and, and he had a, a truck, and he had a little Alfa Romeo, and he packed all his stuff, and we drove hauling that Alfa Romeo back to Santa Barbara, and I told my wife that this guy coming to live with us for a little bit, and mm -hmm. uh, which he did, and then um, he opened a conservation studio. He was a great restorer of paintings, mm -hmm. and but I mean, he, you know, he was way better than just a restorer. I mean, he had had in art painting shows in Guadalajara. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just, you know, the hell of a guy. And he had a very scientific mind as well. Um, and they talked me into open the gallery, and we did. You know, we had a gallery from, uh, let's see, when did he get over there? Well, I, before that, Probably seventy six. I mean, we we had a gallery, and while I was doing the show, right, and he actually had helped me find some good saltillos. Mike Haskell had helped me find some good saltillos. Mm -hmm. In fact, the one that's on the cover I got from yep. from Mike. And um, and so you opened a gallery in seventy six as well. About that time. About that time. Yeah, and how long did that stay open? I think until eighty. Five. Mm -hmm. It's maybe, almost ten years. Yeah. And what shut it down? Why did you get out of the uh, gallery business? Um, because Carlos was getting divorced. He didn't, you know, he's a very emotional guy. Yeah. He decided yeah. that he couldn't live in the same town with his ex-wife. Yeah. He couldn't stand the pain. Yeah. So he moved here to Santa Fe <laughs> and opened a gallery on the old Santa Fe Trail, and he was probably here for another ten years. What was that called? Carlos, uh, just a sauna gallery. Yeah, sauna gallery. Yeah, yeah, I think I actually had been in that gallery. Yeah. yeah. But he was incredibly knowledgeable about New Mexican stuff, pre-Columbian, mm -hmm. Mexican colonial. And so in the period when we had our gallery in Santa Barbara, I mean, I had one of the best educations. Yeah, you were learning all the time. Yeah, and taught me how to restore things and how to look at things a little differently mm -hmm. and we'd go down to Mexico looking for furniture looking for pre-Columbian but he had also lived in Sa in Santa Fe back in the 50s mm -hmm. Carlos was about 10 years old mm -hmm. and um, you know he knew E. Boyd and he knew uh, Eleanor Bedell and all these early dealers mm -hmm. and I mean he knew I mean he was friends with a lot of the Hermano Mayors that were in uh, Moradas and Truchas mm -hmm. Trampas, and they would bring him stuff to either restore, to fix, or to sell, because mm -hmm. they needed to raise some money. And so, and he knew Alan Vetter, I mean, all of the early mm -hmm. New Mexican aficionados of the yeah, so he day. gave you also an insight into these other people collectors and things which helped you yeah and and as I had, a dealer for sure yeah so i learned about new mexican material i mean furniture santos retablos, bultos retablos textiles mm -hmm. but i'd already 
had an affinity for the textiles and I knew what we were doing. So it was a natural yeah. fit. And um, boy, he taught me so much. You know? <laughs> and so when you finished in, with that gallery in 86? Somewhere around right there. Right in that time. Then yeah. what, do you, what did you do? So then I'm just doing shows. Yep. And, um, you know, but I, I mean, I still go out on the reservation looking for jewelry. I hit, you know, I gallop and, you know, the middle of the month, end of the month, hit right. for looking for the pawn stuff that was coming out. And, um, you see other traders sometimes when you're, you're there and they're coming in or you're going out and you know, oops. Yes, I did. Got there a little bit too Yes, late. I did. Um, <laughs> all of a sudden becomes a small <laughs> community, yeah, right. you know. But I mean, like I know my Haskell had been doing even before I did. Mm -hmm. But he was hitting the Tuba City and the northern and mm -hmm. area. He wasn't so much a Gallup guy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he'd be Farmington, Aztec, and all those guys. And of course, he'd run into guys like Murdoch and John Hill and that were working that area. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, and the Navajo Res Reservation is a big place, but there's yeah. only so many trading posts. That's you know? right. And, uh, and just so much jewelry. Yeah, I exactly. go. And were you dealing in any contemporary jewelry at, you know, from really once you closed your gallery down, or was it just all more historic material? Only historic yeah. stuff. And the thing is, but even before I closed, the, way before I closed the gallery, in fact, back in the very early 70s, mm -hmm. 70, maybe even 70, I'd got into making jewelry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I knew you knew a lot about jewelry. Because and I, I was making stuff that was meant to fool people, and I did. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I was selling a lot of stuff to Larry Frank. I was selling stuff to Chris Seltzer. I was selling stuff to John Holstein. I was selling stuff to... And would you portray this as old? Mm -hmm. But without really saying it, I'd just say, "Wow, yeah. it looks old to me." Okay. Because they'd go, "What do you What do you think?" And yeah. I said, "Wow, it looks pretty early to me." And they go, "Yeah." And then in about seventy eight, I was having trouble with living with myself and making a mistake and somebody right. finding out and. <laughs> Somebody called well, the police, and the and the money the money's getting bigger too. Oh, it's getting a lot bigger. Yeah. So it's... and um, so I go. I can't. I got to change this. I can't do this anymore. Yes. So it was about seventy eight, seventy nine. I don't know. I just started calling all the guys I'd sold stuff to and said, yep. "Look, man, I made it. I'll give you your money back." Yep. And that was an interesting thing yeah how'd that go we're probably not too damn well i would think it sometimes it it was really pretty interesting yeah i mean sometimes there were a few guys that were really upset yeah and i couldn't blame them nobody likes to be fooled right nobody wants to feel foolish and you know i had a couple people that wouldn't talk to me for years mm -hmm. um but I don't think there was anybody that didn't eventually call me and go, you know, I appreciate what you did. Yeah. And uh, what'd you do when you get the pieces back? Um, I would melt them down or give them as family presents. My mom had a bunch of it. Yeah. Um, did you hallmark any of that material? Mm -mm. No. Mm -mm. I I didn't make that much. I yeah. mean, I'm. But what I made. I mean, for example, with Larry Frank. Yeah. I mean, I would. You know, I could find good bracelets and rings and concho belts. Right. Finding a good early squash blossom was really difficult. They were the rarest of the things. Right. So I would have a bag of good jewelry that I was going to sell Larry, but I needed something to entice him yeah, to where kicker. he couldn't, couldn't resist. Yeah. So I'd make a really good squash blossom. In <laughs> the 1880s, mm -hmm. he can get squash blossom. <laughs> and, and that's what they were buying. Yeah. You know, it, it made them buy the rest. Yes. And, um, you know, for, in, you know, in Larry Frank's situation, um, I'd call him and say, Larry, I made that necklace and I'll give you your money back. And he, he would just kind of laugh and go, no, that's fine. 
and I, it took me a while. I mean, I'd call him six, eight times yeah. trying to get convince right. him. Right. And finally, I realized that he thought I was trying to get it back for yourself. Yeah. That it was a ploy. Yeah. And uh, I finally figured it out. And I said, God damn it, Larry. I'm telling you straight, man. <laughs> I did make it. Yeah. And he would go, well, I like it. Yeah. I go, okay, I don't know what else to do. <laughs> um, I remember uh, I went to Jim Fowler's um, gallery in Scottsdale. Right. And I had, it was the only Zuni type piece of jewelry I'd ever made. I made a cross necklace that was strung on four strands of jaw claw heishi. And it was beautiful. It's in Skystone and Silver Book. Mm -hmm. And I'd taken it into him, and, and he goes, I like it. How much? And I said, you know, I gave him price, expensive price. I mean, it was like 4000 and he goes, how about trade? And I go, what do you got in mind? He goes, well, I'll give you $1,500. He had a Jimmy Swinnerton painting of Monument Valley that was like this. Yeah. He goes, I give you that. And then he pulls out of the Carl Oscar board of uh, Palm Canyon. and mm -hmm. gouache, probably. No, oil. Well. Oil, okay. yeah. Of Palm Canyon and Palm mm -hmm. Springs. And I go, okay. You know, I sold the Swinnerton for... 4,500, I and think. was this your necklace? Yes, yes. Uh, that I'd made. Yeah. It was the only Zuni inlay stuff I ever made. Yeah. But it had a big cross, and then it had two smaller crosses, but they were all different. Yeah. I mean, the design in them. And um, so he was like the last guy I went to see because I'm going, this could go really bad. Because mm -hmm. you've sold the paintings. Mm -hmm. You've already sold the paintings. The ones that he traded. Yes. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, and I got 4500 for the Swinnerton, and I got like, well, I hadn't sold to Car Carlos Gabor. I actually had given it to my mom. And... Um, so I go, Jim, can I, I've got, I need to talk to you. Oh, you know? It's a horrible conversation to have. And he goes, well, yeah. And I said, private. And he goes, okay, come into my office. And he cl we closed the door and I go, I, I want to tell you something. That channel necklace that I sold you, I made. And he looks at me and he goes, no shit. It's my wife's favorite piece of jewelry. Can you make me a bracelet to go with it? <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. I mean, the relief, I can't begin to tell you. Oh, yeah. And um, So there's a, a bracelet that went with it? No, I <laughs> said, did, Jim, no. The point is I'm not going to do this anymore. Yeah. So that was the end of that, yeah. that forgery career. Right, right. And... Um, you know, I still do a lot of restoration for people. And, sure. You know, make missing parts for a bridal. Or, right. You know, but. Uh, what do you think that taught you going through that process? That's a pretty, that's a pretty uh, big ordeal, really. Um, well, I, it, it, I don't know. It's probably a, a, a lesson I've kind of learned from over the years. I mean, it's c kind of carried forward, but I think the main thing was it was a relief that I didn't have to worry about somebody finding out and accusing me. Right. And I got it all out in the open, and you yep. can like me or not, I don't right. care. Right. But I'm straight with myself. Yeah. And that's where I needed to be. Yeah. Probably made it easier to go do business from then on out. Yeah, it did. Yeah. yeah, except, you know, of course, people would see that and they were always in a little leery no matter what I said. Hmm. But I understand that because right. that's, the, that's the environment I created by my action. So you got to live with it, you know. Um, but the funny thing is, those things you've made <laughs> probably would be quite valuable now as your own pieces. Because you've been in the business so long and you're considered an expert in the field. 
Yeah, at least of historical interest, you yeah, know, yeah. in terms, and, you know, I mean, my first wife, Lisa Drazic, was one of the early Pagosa silversmiths. Mm. And, um, you know, she'd been working up there for f six, seven years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Buffalo, and there are all a number of these, Jimmy O'Neill and all these early Anglo silversmiths. Right. And they had a friend in L.A. that was a, a documentary movie guy, pretty successful, a great guy named Jer Jeremy Leppard. And he liked all these kids. Right. You know, and so he had a, a, a building on Robertson Avenue, and he had opened, they have silver shows in the winter, you know, mm -hmm. they'd leave for ghosts and work all summer and then come to LA to sell in the winter. And, um, and Phil Forrest fan would hire Lisa to do all kinds of silver work and always wanted to have a show for her, but she wasn't that prolific. And, um, so I learned about their work and I learned how to, and, in my own situation, I mean, and, and George Wenham that had this great collection of, of early jewelry, the guy that gave me this ring, mm -hmm. we would just talk about the aesthetics of it and why one thing was so, more appealing than something else. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I was so involved from all levels, technical, technical level, the historical level, and the aesthetic level. Right. And um, I think the aesthetic one is the biggest I, in, in some respects. There's, oh, I think so, because yeah. George Wenham didn't know shit about technology and he did, knew even less about history. But he had an eye right. that he had one of the great, some of the best jewelry I've ever seen. And um, Yeah, I think that's one of the best ways for people to really understand early uh, Indian jewelry is to go to museums that have documented pieces and really study those to kind of see the aesthetics. You can also tell the construction, but really the aesthetics. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, there's a number, there's a number of dealers in, in our field here that they may not be great historians and they may know nothing about technology, but they have really sophisticated eyes. Right. I mean, and those guys have longevity. Yeah, no. You know, because that's what it's, it takes. It's hard to buy that. Yeah. <laughs> or yeah, learn I mean, that. Yeah, it is. I mean, you've got to have that underneath right you've got to have that to progress i think well you also work with laura phillips right yes loris and i have been friends i mean we both grew up in pasadena area she mm -hmm. was in uh, you know, what, right near pasadena there and um and she had known george Wenham. that's how i met her because she was always coming in george's and looking at his jewelry and, mm -hmm. and um You know, we, we, we're, we're friends. Um, there's a story there. I can see it brewing. There underneath. is such a story there. <laughs> so I had, I had made this necklace yeah. and it had come out so good. And I, I mean, even I go, oh, I, yeah. I like this. <laughs> and so I, I, I called Loris and said, Loris, I think I've got something you're going to like. And this is like 73, 74, or something mm -hmm. like that. And uh, so I go see her, and, and I show it to her, and she goes, let me show it to Jimmy. And I go, sure. And she goes, can I keep it for a few days and study it? And I said, sure. So I left, and... and about a week later, and I'm, you know, I'm not going to call, you know, I'm just waiting for her mm -hmm. to decide. And then one evening, I'm not there, but, and I was staying, I, my dad had an apartment under the house, you know, and that was where I was staying. And she, he just came up and left it on his front door uh -huh. and didn't say a word. Uh, and I was kind of disappointed. And You couldn't fool her. Uh, no, I, that's what I thought. Yeah. But that wasn't the situation oh. at all. So 
in the eighties when we start to do these seminars together. Right. And we became more and more friends and, right. and, 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 and her husband was a great guy. And so we became really good friends and I'd go down and we'd spend hours, go out to dinner and yep. look at stuff. And right. she, she was always, what do you think of this? What, yeah, and she, she was really it. active. Oh yeah. She loved it. Yeah. And one evening we go out to dinner and she goes, Jim, I have a confession. And she goes, Jimmy, pull that thing out of the, my purse there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he pulls out this, a copy of this necklace that I had shown her 30 years before. Yes. Uh -huh. And she goes, I love this necklace so much that I thought I could get somebody to make a good copy of it. Uh -huh. So she's doing what I was doing. <laughs> That's funny. And I, I mean, we, we all laughed about it. Yeah. I mean, it was so funny. And the guy that she'd taken it to did a crappy job and didn't look like crap. Yeah. She goes, that's why I never ever showed anybody yeah. because it wasn't like the one you did. Right. And uh, it was just, it was pretty. And, and of course her collection was just phenomenal. Oh, she had. Is in now the wheel, right? So people can go and look at it and examine it. And yeah, a great collection. It is really, I mean, it's yeah. just, it's a, it's a type study. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and and there's a lot of great documentation, right? But and probably the most valuable part of it is the Fred Pestelkai part, mm -hmm. because he was an LA guy, right? You know, worked down on Alvera Street, and but he was working there from you know I think from at least from the 20s through the 50s. Yeah, a very long time. Yeah, that yeah. sounds right. In fact, I met him mm. in the early 70s because my stepmother was a nurse and was working at Lavinia, which was a hospital for lung diseases, mm -hmm. um, pulmonary diseases. And he was there. And, you know, my stepmother knew what I would love that stuff. Right. And she knew the name because I told her and, and she said, would you like to meet him? I said, yeah, <laughs> hell yes. Yeah, because he's a master silversmith. Oh, man, he was. Well, what was he like? Well, he was in a wheelchair. Yeah. Um, the thing I really remember the most about him was uh, he was a handsome guy. Mm -hmm. and, and you could tell he was pretty, had been tall mm -hmm. and robust and, you know, but he was past that now. But he would look straight at you and he would smile and chuckle. Mm -hmm. And you would say something and he'd laugh and say, I mean, he just was such a good natured yeah. guy. Just a positive guy. And I mean, I don't think, I don't think he was probably dead six months after I yeah. met him. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, he made such great jewelry and with the huh. beautiful Lone Mountain stones that he loved. Yeah, to use. and he was a master at matching turquoises, you know, and multi stone bracelets yes. or whatever it was. Um, but he was as precise as his father had been, yeah. just in a more contemporary style. Mm -hmm. And, um, but you know, he, I mean, he knew all the Hollywood elite. He'd sold stuff to him. He was friends with uh, Frank Tinney Johnson. Mm -hmm. um, oh, who was that silent cowboy guy? That, Archie. Gene Archie. No, before him, um, that had been in the silent Films. films and had built a house out there in Calabasa, and, you know, was friends with Will Rogers mm -hmm. and, and all that early. Yeah, Hollywood he could have even known Maynard Dixon, actually. Yeah, he could have. Yeah, easily. Easily, because he, he knew yeah, Frank Dixon, Kenny Johnson. Yeah, Dixon went down to L.A. He was there. Yeah. 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 He worked oh, on yeah. projects in L.A. Yeah. On a long period of time. And so he knew artists and he knew actors and producers. Yeah. And, he was a cosmopolitan person, yeah. for sure. And, um, in fact, I I went into a guy's house in the mid seventies, an old guy, and he had he knew Fred mm -hmm. and um, had some of his jewelry, and so I went over and uh, he had probably ten Frank Tenney Johnson's paintings in yeah. his house. 
You were just looking at the jewelry. Well, no. Then oh, yeah. I go, I'm going, okay. Okay, you got it. You already knew. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was going, wow. And I mean, there were some really good ones. Yeah. And he knew Frank Tenney Johnson. Uh -huh. And he knew Fred Peschel guy. And he bought stuff from both of them. And so we're talking. And um, I'm looking at his jewelry. And I'm going, wow, well, yeah, this is, this is good stuff. You know, mm -hmm. what, what are you asking? And going, well, I'm not sure. What do you think? And I'd say, well, I pay this and this. And he goes, yeah, I think we can do that. And he goes, do you like Indian clothing? Mm -hmm. And I go, yeah, sure. I'm thinking there might be a war shirt or something. Right. Anyway, he goes, well, go into the guest bedroom back there and there's a closet and open it up. And you'll see some stuff hanging there, and there's Hiawatha's shirt. Hmm. And I'm going, well, I'm sure he's got that confused with something. Anyway, I go look at it, and it's a Hollywood prop. Yeah. And it had been used in making a TV thing on Hiawatha yeah. or a movie or whatever. And, you know, I'm pretty young and still pretty stupid and still pretty outspoken and you know <laughs> saying things before i thought about it it's uh -huh. why i go back and i go hey, look you know hiawatha is a fictional character you know he didn't really exist he just got furious uh -huh. and he said get out of my house and don't ever come back <laughs> Good way to make yeah. friends and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> God. And I, after that, I did start to learn a little, become a little more professional and be yeah. a little more respectful. I didn't matter, you know. I didn't have to be right about yeah, that's stupid right. stuff, yeah. you know. Yeah, cost you a lot. It cost me a lot, and uh, that's one of the le one of the hard lessons to learn. Yeah, <laughs> we and, all learn this. Yeah. And, um, but I look back over it, you know, we've talked about Carlos and we've talked about George Wenham, a lot of other guys that I learned a lot from. Mm -hmm. I mean, Terasaki, Economos, Holstein, because they came to the Great Western. And, you know, what I thought was cool was maybe a, a pair of matching teepee, teepee bags mm -hmm. or a pair of, you know, parade mucks and beat it on the bottom on or two gray hills. Right. And these guys weren't looking for that. No, they were at a different level of looking. Totally. And I began to see that. And that was really an eye opener. That There was a different level. Yes. A whole different level. And there's more money at that level than there is at the level I'm in. And so that's when I started to learn about, you know, blankets as opposed to rugs and, mm -hmm. you know, pre-reservation beadwork and, you know, the rare stuff. Yeah, and aesthetics. Yeah. And Sometimes it's all about aesthetics for yeah. the piece too. And, um, I mean, I was, I was really good on California baskets. You know, I think Haskell may have been even more knowledgeable than I, but we both had the aesthetics for mm -hmm. it. You know, we understood the right. aesthetics. Um, but it took us a while separately and individually to kind of realize that we needed to learn a lot more. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's, you know, the Saltillo thing was the thing for me and, and, and of course the jewelry. But then with Carlos, I got introduced to the New Mexican and much deeper understanding and appreciation yeah. for Spanish colonial stuff. And he and I and Haskell went down to Mexico many times looking for Spanish colonial stuff. And I think Haskell wrote a great story for a magazine about some escapades we had in Mexico <laughs> in the late seventies. Yeah. Um, it sounds like you picked the right profession for you after all that looking and the things that you could have done. Well, it's, I look, I look at it now and I realize there's nothing else I would rather do yeah. than this. 
not as energetic as I used to be, but there's no retirement. And because I still love it, there's no, I mean, I can't retire because there's nothing else I would rather do than yeah. this except maybe play with my grandkids, but yeah. I'm not going to do that full time. Uh -huh. So, and you still get great material. You've got great material. Yeah. And, and every, you know, every, it seems like every year you find some great thing yeah. that you just didn't, you, you think it's all gone and it's not. It's that joy of discovery, isn't yeah. it? Oh, yeah. It's just, yeah, I mean, it's a rush, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's great when you find good stuff. Yeah, with history, because I know you just love that history, as I do. Yeah. It just brings it to a different level of importance. Yeah, and, and it, it, the thing when you find something really good, you're obsessed with finding out really what it was and how it worked and, mm -hmm. and really understanding it, the importance of it. And that's how you really learn. Mm -hmm. And that's what even deepens the appreciation of it. Yeah. And so you feel like you can offer it to somebody, but you can also give them some insight with it, hopefully, you know, because they are documents of the past. Oh, and yeah. they bring that period and that history alive and that culture alive. I mean, it's magical. Mm -hmm. It's magical stuff. Do you think our business will continue to have dealers that do this and follow up? I mean, it's, we're all both getting toward the end part of our career. I do because it's man's do been doing it for thousands of years. Yeah. I mean, in China, 14th century artists were reproducing 10th century artists because they thought it was so good and they wanted to right. carry, present that heritage, you know, carry forth. You know, in English still, if they, you know, some farmer works, they plowing a crop and he comes across some early Roman or early English jewelry or, you know, mm -hmm. gold coins. They take them to the museum. The museum pays them fair value. But way before the museum thing, there were wealthy people that were collecting that stuff. And some peasant finds something, he takes it to the local lord, and he goes, look what I found. And if the local lord didn't pay him what he thought was fair price, there were other people looking for that stuff. Yeah. So it's, it's, you know, yeah. it's part of the history of, of us. People love to collect. I think, yeah. and especially certain people like, like yourself and mine, we have some kind of genetic thing, I think, almost that's ingrained in us to want to collect and to know it and understand it and and share it. Yeah, and I think you you are right that probably the thing that stimulates that the most is the aesthetic part of it. It's for me, for sure. Yeah, 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 without a doubt. So I'm. I mean, it's been on. It's been a good run for me. You know? <laughs> You're not done yet. No, I'm not. But you know, you get all this noise about the Tata thing and all those these problems and yeah. But man's been doing it for thousands of years, yeah. so I, yeah. I don't think they can reformulate mankind that quickly. Yeah, I don't think so either. So. Jim. Thank you for coming. This has been enlightening, to say the least. Well, it's been my pleasure, yeah, Mark. No, I, knew, I knew this would be interesting. And, uh, yeah, it, and, I, and I wasn't disappointed. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. And I yeah. really do want to yeah. thank you, man. Yeah, no, I enjoy absolutely. it because it's got me thinking about all kinds of stuff. You know, we just seem to move, you know, day to day, and we don't really take a retrospective. That's the problem, you know. You know, I've known you for 25, 30 years mm -hmm. and probably hadn't spent more than 40 minutes talking to you, 30 minutes, and with lots of noise and things going around. Yeah, but I mean, we had conversation when we did the Seattle show because there's nobody there. That's the thing, right? <laughs> we were talking, it was all dealers talking yeah. there's no people. There were no people. Yeah. Yeah, there were no people. <laughs> um, so it's, for me, it's like a real joy to be able to sit intimately and talk to somebody and find out who they are, what they are, why they do it, what that passion is. And you clearly have that passion. Uh, like most of our uh, mm -hmm. people I interview that are in the you know, dealer business, they just love it. I mean, you love the culture, you love the material, and I think you're a good custodian and uh, ambassador for it. You know, we we all have our times when we may make mistakes and do yeah, things have, wrong. I, but, yeah, we've had a few. Uh, I have a few shortcomings, but yeah, we all do. Everybody yeah, does. Sure, it's being a human, uh, but recognizing those shortcomings and then coming back and saying, "Hey, you know, this is what happened." And, yeah, I got. It. I mean, I knew I had to change my whole direction. I yeah. could not continue that down yeah. that path. Yeah. I had to regroup, get back, 
get clean and straight with everybody yep. and then I then think I in some ways forward. it gives you more cred. Because that's a very hard thing to do. It would have been easy just to walk away from that. Yeah, I you know, I, I'll tell you, Mark, I'm not sure, at least for me, that's the case. Um because I've over time probably the most formative time of my life was Vietnam. Mm, I'm sure. And you you see, I mean, I, I saw within the first 30 days of being in Vietnam, more dead people than any 10, 15 people, normal people will ever, all of them combined will ever see in their lifetime. Right. I mean, I'd see body bags being loaded, uh, unloaded out of helicopters. I'd see Vietnamese mothers with kids, you know, because we get mortar attacked all the time, you know. They come to us for medical care, and you know what I mean? They have a baby with the hand missing, mm -hmm. or the mother would have the ha hand missing and taking us, you know, for that, but carrying the baby. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the, the horrors of it are, there's no, it's a reality that you only encounter in that kind of a situation. Right, war. Yeah, and you know, I had so many good friends that didn't come back, or particularly my Vietnamese friends that I saw die right there. Mm -hmm. And you try to figure out the meaning of it all. You know, what does this mean? And how do you deal with it? And you realize that life is fleeting. And the only thing that really matters, because we don't know if we're going to make it next week or next year or 20 oh, years. Yeah, that's right. So you need to, what you have with the time you have, you need to do the best you can. And that means also being really, you can lie to other people, but you can't lie to yourself yeah, or you've right. got no chance is yeah. my viewpoint on it. If you can't be straight with yourself, you've got no chance. And so that was, it was something I had to do, you yeah. know, I mean, yeah. I mean, believe me, come, coming and telling somebody that I cheated them yeah. was not comfortable. But it was a whole lot easier than going on a night operation and being shot at by the Viet Cong. Yeah. No, you already had perspective. Yeah, but it took me a while to, you know, it took me years actually to sort it out yeah. and well, kind of put it together. I think and, a lot of people need therapy that go through that. You know, that's a really traumatic environment i dealt with those people when i was in the military as a doctor yeah i saw those guys yeah and girls and and um and i can tell you one thing that didn't help was coming back and turning to drugs for help yeah that just made it worse yeah. or alcohol or yeah. combination yeah. and i had those dark years where it was a lot of drugs and a lot of alcohol and a lot of yeah Yep. But takes time. Yeah. I think you've made it around the corner. I feel pretty good about <laughs> it. <laughs> I, I feel know. like I, I did survive. It. <sighs> and, uh, you know, now it's like I just want to, you know, contribute in the business and, and, and be a good example. But I also want to take care of my kids and my grandkids sure. and be a good example there. And, well, I think this podcast will let them know you are. Well, thank you. I know they will. Thank you, Jim. All right, that was wonderful. Thank you for sharing, by the way. My pleasure. All right. Good for me, too. Yeah, that's fantastic. We need your support for the Medicine Man Gallery channel, so make sure to click the subscribe button and tap the little bell icon to be notified when we upload a new video, which we do every morning on Wednesday and Friday. See you soon.